these are people you know whose whole agenda especially you know certain people in the in the left leaning media and uh, you know certain uh, people who call themselves activists and these are people who you know earns their bread and butter to be fair by you know by talking such nonsense Namaste everyone welcome to Chitti Media I am your host Sharan Sethi with us today we have someone very special uh, someone who has worked in the economic times and reuters before he's a mentor he's a columnist and a media professional uh, Mr Suraj Balakrishnan Suraj ji namaste welcome to Chitti Media Namaste thank you for having me Sir how are you and how is everyone because we are living through a pandemic and it would be nice to hear from you yeah you know i hate this new phrase the new normal but uh, that's i think what we're all dealing with right now here you know we're living in this uh, pandemic environment uh, and uh, i guess you know it's life is pretty much the new normal is you know we're all getting used to it now you know we're not really going to restaurants or uh, you know to a lot of indoor places as we used to but uh, we are making most of what we have and enjoying a lot of family time I'm really glad to hear that. Um, so, if I could move on to my first question now, uh, the talking point has been the Olympics that recently concluded, and India's one of the best performances in a very long time. Now, very few people were perhaps expecting this. Uh, what are your initial comments on this, and what do you think uh, the government did uh, different this time? to actually make a difference and to take it up a notch before this 2020 tokyo olympics was only six medals in 2012 in london so the benchmark that we were dealing with was not exactly very high you know it was just six medals and that's not exactly you know that much for a country of india stature as you know we keep repeating so on that front i fully expected us to you know have our best olympics ever in at least in terms of leveling up to to london 2012 or surpassing that and if you remember you know it wasn't just the seven medals but a lot of athletes came very very close you know you have these uh, seven medals that we mm-hmm. have including the big uh, the big golden boy neeraj chopra right at the end but you also had a number of athletes who you know came very close in very unexpected sports like you know uh, you know rowing you know and A lot of other things, which surprised a lot of people, including uh, you know, I am told even uh, people in the sports ministry and the federations as well. So in that sense, a lot of very good surprises, uh, you know, were in store for us. Sindhu on another day could have even got a gold medal. Bajrang could have got a gold, and uh, you know, and then you had uh, Lavina, you know, coming against all odds and winning uh, that uh, uh, you know bronze. You had Mirabai winning the silver. so you had a lot of positive you know surprises at the same time of course you had uh, you know mary who uh, tragically could not you know probably end her last olympic games with uh, another medal and uh, then you know you had uh, you know vinesh fogat again who's very very highly ranked very highly rated who tragically again could not do it neither could sonam and the other you know highly sought after you know wrestlers so on that front uh, there were a few you know disappointments and of course the big disappointment uh, that i was coming to was dipika kumari and uh, you know in archery where uh, she you know was world number 1 and uh, a lot of you know hopes on her so uh, some disappointments there but on the whole while you know we should acknowledge and feel very proud of our seven medals there what you know shouldn't be forgotten is that a lot of athletes finished fourth fifth and came very very close you know losing out in the semi finals so all in all it's been a it's been a good campaign it's been a very good campaign and uh, i think uh, you know you asked broadly about the larger sporting ecosystem in india and that's something that i think you know both of us the entire country you know everyone listening should be really really proud because what this government has done you know if you compare to what was there previously and under the narendra modi regime in 2014 towards the latter half of 2014 this government under you know at that time anurag thakur who is currently the sports minister but you know <clears throat> at the time he wasn't he was just an mp 
he uh, led this committee and um, set up something called TOPS, Targeted Olympic Podium Scheme. Now, what this TOPS does is it looks at around six or seven high priority sports. I'm talking about archery, badminton, wrestling, weightlifting, and a couple more. Uh, you know, uh, you have shooting, and um, I'm not sure if I'm recollecting, but uh, you know, around six, seven uh, high priority sports where traditionally India has done well. You know, and we've looked upon these high priority sports and tried to focus all our energies on that to maximize in those sports where we are traditionally very good, both in terms of genetics, both in terms of history. If you look at, you know, previous Olympic records and of course our, you know, overall skill set. <clears throat> for example, we know that China is very good at, you know, table tennis, for example. India has been traditionally good at shooting, you know. India has now got a great reputation at weightlifting at wrestling where you know the likes of Bajrang Sakshi and you know others have really excelled so in that sense you know I think uh, government has done a really good thing by identifying these six or seven sports where we are good at where we are competent where our body structure or body structure of the athletes is you know aligned to winning medals or excelling in that sport and then what they've done is they've basically of course apart from you know, the monthly stipend given to all these uh, athletes who fall under this top scheme. Effectively, you have, uh, as the government of India, they have given these athletes who have identified in this top scheme the best of facilities in terms of foreign training, in terms of coaches, in terms of exposure, in terms of tournaments, you know, that they can compete at. And they've given these guys, you know, so much of exposure. Like, for example, Neeraj, you know, like <clears throat> a lot of the foreign athletes, I can tell you, when COVID struck in uh, March 2020 or even earlier, February 2020, a lot of the foreign athletes had actually come back to their base camp, base camp as in their home country and, you know, the, the city where they live in and kind of just, uh, you know, put their feet up or try to do whatever they could training at home. Neeraj was actually told by the, you know, Athletics Federation and of course by the private bodies that sponsor him as well to remain there in Europe, to continue his training with absolutely no interruption, no delay whatsoever. He was given full backing by, you know, both the Athletics Federation of India, the Sports Ministry, JSW Sports, which uh, sponsors him, which manages him as well. And that you can see the result of that. You can see the impact that, you know, continuous, focused, no hindrance training does to that. And, you know, you've seen the gold medal arrive home. And the same thing for athletes like Bajra, who has a very close relationship with his coach, Shako, and, you know, plenty of others. And Sindhu, of course, is, is Sindhu. She's a GOAT now. So uh, in, in that sense, what uh, this top scheme does is, is really it prioritizes areas where they're good at and it really, you know, sort of puts certain eggs in that basket and gives these athletes the wings to fly. So in that sense, unlike, you know, previously where it's, you know, you kind of making a kitchery and you're putting every single, you know, uh, trying to put a piece here, a piece there and trying to make something out of it. Here, there is a plan. There's a targeted approach. There's a clear direction and, uh, you know, you're seeing it now, you know, in, uh, in terms of how much we progressed, how many medals we won in Commonwealth 2018, Asian Games 2018, and now in the Olympics. And Sharan, one very interesting stat <coughs> coming back. So as of today, there are roughly around 104, 105 athletes in this top scheme. And if you go back to, uh, and many of these athletes, or literally every single one of these athletes have, you know, one uh, won medals in 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 in, uh, in the sense that uh, I beg your pardon, all the ones who won medals are all you know tops uh, top scheme athletes. So yeah. anyone who is in the top scheme has you know gone to win medals. But if you look at the Commonwealth Games uh, of 2018, which happened in Gold Coast, you know down under in Australia, out of 70 odd at Indian athletes who won medals, 47 of them were in the top scheme. 47 of them. So it goes to show what planning has been done and the results that have been done accordingly. So there's a clear direction here with this new regime and, a, you know, and a way forward, which can only happen through proper planning right from the top all the way to the grassroots. Right. Thank you for that elaborate answer. Suraji, there's one more observation which is coming out. A lot of commentators and experts have been putting this out. One of the quantified studies uh, done recently actually shows that several states, especially Haryana and regions like the Northeast, perform significantly better when it comes to sports, specifically the Olympics. 
Uh, what is the reason behind this phenomenon? Yeah, you know, Sean, I read that stat that you're mentioning, and I believe out of 23 Olympic medals, 23 individual Olympic medals in India has won since independence. Seven out of them, seven out of 23, have come from Haryana, from one state. And you have to give credit to, you know, all the chief ministers and all the, you know, the politicians and all the sports administrators as well in Haryana, because, you know, we've heard about the famous Akara culture, especially in wrestling, where, you know, right from Yogeshwar uh, Dutt to Bajrang Panya, his prodigy, you know, Bajrang keeps referring to Yogi as my, you know, my dear mentor. And um, the Vijayendra Singh and, you know, a lot of other athletes across fields, you know, right from boxing to wrestling to, you know, other athletes. These, all these, uh, you know, athletes have been given really good uh, exposure, really good training right from, uh, from a young age. And they play in that, you know, really desi rustic field, you know, which gives them that, you know, added advantage with very few distractions. You know, when you look at Niraj's interview, you know, he always says, I don't want to have a girlfriend. I don't want, you know, any of this. I just want to, you know, train, win more medals for the country, win, you know, maybe another goal in Paris. And that's the attitude that we need our sportsmen to have, you know, instead of the, you know, the big city life and metros and, you know, getting very distracted and, you know, losing your focus, like, you know, many examples that I'm sure you and I can think of. So in that sense, Haryana is really now the, you know, the biggest playing ground, the biggest, uh, you know, medal uh, ground for Indian athletes. And um, long may they continue. Manipur, incidentally, is, is a slightly more recent phenomenon, partly because not much attention has been given historically to the Northeast, you know, in the past by the Congress governments, as we, we know for, you know, for many, many uh, years now. But especially post this regime and post, you know, someone like uh, the Arunachal MP, Kiran Rijiju, who was formerly the sports minister, currently law minister, when he came in and, you know, he really kind of, you know, went through his network and he, you know, made a lot of overtures to the respective governments in Arunachal and Manipur and, you know, Nagaland, Mizoram, especially in Manipur, which is known to produce a lot of great boxers. And now, of course, we have Mirabai as well, you know, we have a weightlifter as well and some wrestlers as well. So in that sense, Manipur is really, you know, becoming the athletes, many of them, you know, are, are really strong, but at the same time, they are coming from really impoverished backgrounds. So they don't really have much in life except, you know, sports to sort of, you know, get their family away from poverty. So that really helps. That motivation, not just to win an Olympic medal for India, but to get your family off poverty, that's a great motivation. Okay. Uh, so, Riti, thank you for that. Uh, there's one more observation uh, that's uh, coming to light. The newspaper headline that read after Indian hockey team secured the bronze was that it took us nearly four decades to achieve that feat once again. And before that, if you were actually to read read upon the history of uh, Indian hockey team in pre and post independent India, we were one of the best in the world. So how did we lose those 40 years and to what? You know, uh, Sharan, we often talk about 41 years. That is, you know, what has been quoted in all the papers, all the media reports. 41, a medal after 41 years. But what we often, you know, fail to, uh, you know, mention is 41 years before, in 1980, when the Olympic Games happened, literally most countries outside the, you know, USSR bloc had boycotted it, right? Because of the USSR, in, in, you know, invasion of, uh, of Afghanistan, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. And as a result, very few countries participate in that Olympics. So if we actually look at it, you know, realistically, we are winning a medal after 49 years, you know, if you, if you take away or discount 1980. And uh, that happened in 72 in Munich, you know, again, under pretty controversial circumstances because uh, West Germany had got a lot of, you know, very controversial calls by the referees. And uh, that was also incidentally one of the first Olympic Games that happened in AstroTurf, you know. Uh, not on grass. And uh, so it is 41 plus eight, I would say, uh, you know, years after we are finally uh, seeing an Olympic medal in hockey and uh, thank God for that. But uh, what really has uh, happened is, uh, you know, this entire change of surface from grass to AstroTurf. That's the big issue because when you look at, you know, the change of surface from AstroTurf to grass, that really wrecked havoc for Indian hockey because Traditionally, if you look at our players, you know, we are used to using our wrists a lot, like in cricket. And uh, we rely, especially, you know, the cradle ground of Indian hockey, which is Punjab and Haryana, especially Punjab. You have a lot of players coming in 
you know, using a lot of, uh, you know, talent in terms of uh, trickery, in terms of, you know, skill, in terms of doing some dribbles and, you know, maneuvering themselves up the field and, you know, making these quick passes. Whereas, you know, the Europeans sort of nailed it in AstroTurf because they made the game so much more, you know, about physique, about stamina, about strength, about, you know, using their uh, long, you know, long legs and, you know, the, the, the pace at which they, they run. And that became, a, you know, a much, much uh, bigger aspect of the game. So, again, you know, as they say, another, you know, big games, the rules were changed to suit, uh, you know, the Western imperialists, so to say. So as a result of that, uh, you know, India could never really, you know, compete in the late 70s and 80s with the Western superpowers, uh, you know, post this rule change. But I'm so, so, so happy that, you know, Indian hockey is back and is back with a gap, you know, bang. You have Graham uh, Reed, the, you know, the men's coach. You have, uh, you know, Mion, the, the coach of the women's team. And these guys have, you know, put in so much of professionalism into the system. You've seen the players fitter than I've ever seen before. I mean, if you look at that, look at that India Australia game, our girls were running more. They were fighting hard. They were competing so well against the Australian team. We literally dominated that first half nonstop, and then you know we held on to the lead. Same with the men's team. You know, tragically, Belgium, you know, had the, a bit of luck in terms of refereeing decisions and those penalty corners to you know defeat us. But otherwise, we were dominating. We were, you know, in many respects, a better team. So in terms of fitness, in terms of mentality, in terms of team spirit, and of course, in terms of just the attitude, the pace, this Indian hockey team, both the men's and the women's, they made the country proud. They really made the country proud. So let's forget about the past now, what happened in the 80s and 90s. This is the future. And uh, if Indian hockey, you know, we've made a lot of mistakes, especially the federations and the sporting bodies. But now if Indian hockey does not, you know, take up this current, you know, state and looks upon, you know, this as a motivation to really take it up a notch. We're number three right now. We should be aiming for a World Cup win. We should be aiming for an Olympic win in Paris. If we don't, you know, springboard from here, we never will. Because this is the time. The country's attention is on that. The investors, the sponsors are looking to pump in money in this game. The players are superstars. The game has finally got front page coverage. This is the time. Let's take it off from here. Thank you so much for those insights. Uh, Suraji, that brings me to my next question. You spoke about the geopolitical context uh, in which India couldn't participate in the 70s and the 80s. Uh, even today, if you look at it, there is a sense of competition among countries like the United States and China. Right Now, if we look at uh, the competition on different other metrics, militarily and economically, India is one of the top 10 in the world. Uh, but when it comes to sports, although we are picking up, uh, how long do you think it will take India to actually touch the leader leaderboard uh, in the top five positions at least? Yeah, I mean, that's a million dollar question, isn't it, Sharan? Because on one hand, you know, if you look at the Olympic medal tally right now, India are, what, 42nd in the world after uh, Tokyo 2020? And by the way, we say Tokyo 2020 because, uh, you know, although the Olympics is happening in 2021, the brand is always, you know, Tokyo 2020. It's mm -hmm. happening as well, you know, previously as well. But in that sense, even if, you know, India had the same amount of medals, seven, but in case if you just, you know, jumbled it a bit and you put seven in the gold tally and zero bronze and, you know, zero silver, you get the drift. Then India would actually be in the top 10, right? Because... For the simple reason that the way the Olympic metrics works, the gold, you know, a tally is given a lot of weightage as opposed to uh, silver and bronze naturally. So, you know, if a country wins just, uh, you know, seven to 10 medals and wins a lot of golds, that, you know, that, you know, in effect puts it in the top 10. But coming to your question, uh, and that's, you know, really pertinent, uh, you know, both from a sporting superpowers point of view and also geopolitics, as you said, you know, to sort of, you know, get India's, you know, position right up there, you know, than just an all Zoran. If you think about it, China wasn't in a very different position in the late 70s, right? So in the in the latter half of the 1970s, China barely had any medals. They they are pretty much in the position that India was or in a worse position than India is, you know, in uh, 
is today right now and in a pretty similar position to, uh, to what India was in uh, you know in the 1970s so in that sense you know what China has done since then is what we should be looking at and what they've done is they've you know got a big bunch of athletes big bunch of really young kids aspiring athletes in these sporting schools sporting schools that they call it right from you know age groups as young as five to as old as 12. And in these schools, they get, you know, they train them nonstop every single day is a training session. They give them, you know, basic education just, you know, to make them pass their exams and to, you know, be aware. And otherwise, they are put into such a very, very systematic discipline regime right. that these kids don't know anything else except to, you know, train hard, learn from their coaches learn whatever is being told to them, eat whatever is being given to them, and try to win medals for the country. That's that's their life. That's the only thing they know. And that culture, of course, you know, it's not as easy in India being a democracy, you know, to kind of get people to such things because the parents also have a lot of issues, a lot of, you know, doubts, <clears throat> which are natural doubts, you know. You don't want your kid going, you know, leaving home at such a young age. But these sort of, uh, you know, Thing sort of gets you know a sports inculcated as a habit as from a very very young age, which then you know makes them become champions because you're used to doing that right from a very 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 you know young age. In that respect, in India, even now we start a bit late, but if we can you know get athletes, pick athletes you know say from the age of eight or ideally younger. From eight onwards, and you know, we can put them in these sports schools. Like there's this beautiful private institution called the uh, IIS, Inspire Institute of Sport, which is run by JSW Sports in uh, Bellary in Karnataka, where you're at right now. And uh, that is, you know, a pretty similar institute where uh, you know it, the campus is in the middle of nowhere, and uh, you know these kids have nothing else to do except train, mm -hmm. eat the right stuff, and you know aspire to win medals for the country. So that sort of preparation is, is one aspect. The second, of course, is a lot more investment. I mean, this government, as I said, has done a very good job in terms of the stop scheme, identifying these high priority sports, which, by the way, is the same thing China did. China also identified something called the high priority sports, you know, where they thought that they could win, you know, like table tennis and, you know, um, a lot of other, uh, you know, uh, disciplines where uh, they really felt that they could excel and they could, you know, do really well. Now, of course, they even won the Beijing Olympics, they won the 100 meter race. Uh, they, the 110 meter hurdle, sorry. Uh, they've also won in you know, weightlifting, in you know, judo, in gymnastics, in figure skating, you know, literally everything, you know, China has been winning. So they've, you know, right. first they've started off with this high priority sports areas. Then they have, you know, once they've succeeded in that, they have, you know, moved off across to other areas and even athletics they won. You know, in that respect, India is doing the right thing, you know, in terms of focusing on these high priority sports right now. <clears throat> but going forward, you know, we will need definitely more investment, both from the, you know, as a percentage of the budget in, in the government of India and, uh, you know, from these uh, sports federations separately. And of course, from, you know, individual contributions from corporate houses, from individual donors, you know, from private individuals, from trusts. Like what you know, Reliance and JSW Sports have been doing uh, a phenomenal job. So we need a you know, as the Prime Minister often says, we need a public-private partnership here. And sports is uh, you know not not very far behind. Uh, thank you so much for that elaborate answer, Suriji. That brings me to my last question. Certain commentators, uh, liberal commentators in the other side of the political spectrum, have actually been commenting about certain. Uh, religious practices of the athletes, uh, their personal faith. Why do you think this is happening for the first time? And why do you think uh, they are actually being shamed? And what do you think about this uh, uh, very saddening development? I mean, you know, uh, to be to be really fair, you know, I'm not surprised. And, uh, you know, you don't expect things from certain people, you know, and you, you stop being surprised. You know, I mean, you have the case of a uh, comedian who masquerades as a YouTuber, you know, who said that uh, one movie, you know, should one movie and one, you know, actor, one Bollywood actor should be praised 
and given the plaudits for our hockey victory, you know, for Women's Day. You have uh, a politician masquerading as a comedian in Kunal Kamra talking all sorts of nonsense. You have comedians masquerading as politicians in parliament. I don't need to mention the names. There are too many to count. And we'll probably, you know, carry on doing the show for the next two days if I have to start mentioning the names. So um, these are people, you know, whose whole agenda, especially, you know, certain people in the in the left-leaning media and, uh, you know, certain uh, people who call themselves activists. And these are people who, you know, earns their bread and butter, to be fair, by, you know, by talking such nonsense. So it's not surprising. And I don't think, you know, you and I or anybody, you know, watching this uh, show should really be surprised about the fact that all this is happening. Because literally their funding, you know, comes from trying to denigrate anything that is, you know, talks wonderful or talks great about, you know, this country's glorious heritage, our culture, our ethos, our belief systems. And what makes this country, what gives this country our identity, right? And that is, and, you know, you, you've seen this happening, you know, right from, uh, you know, a chess player or, you know, a cricketer or one of the very few, you know, uh, non Urduized Bollywood stars or, you know, stars that we have. And, you know, some of our politicians and uh, academics as well. So when you have somebody who deviates from the crowd, who doesn't, you know, for lack of a better word, suck up to a certain coterie, a certain cabal, that pushback will happen. You know, if Neeraj Chopra had a different political uh, alignment to what he professes on Twitter, we might have had a completely different reaction to, you know, from these quarters that you mentioned about following his gold medal victory. <clears throat> but the fact that, you know, he has come out so strongly wishing the prime minister and rebuking a certain popular journalist, you know, that, uh, that, you know, these people just can't stand it. They right. just can't stand the fact that a self-made man from a humble background, from a remote tiny village can actually go on eating desi khana, you know, being proud of his desi roots, speaking very rustic, simple Hindi, go on to become the Olympic gold medalist. These people just, cannot stand it. And that is their irony. That is their problem. That is their pain. But don't bother about them. Let them be. Let them be. Right. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, your insights into sports and the politics behind it and the geopolitics behind it is very fascinating to listen to. And I hope that you can join us for lengthier conversations in the future. Uh, Namaste Surajji. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Sharan. Uh, excuse my bad throat, but uh, I had a great time uh, being here. Thanks for hosting me. That's absolutely fine, sir. So having said that, uh, uh, to all our viewers, uh, please do like, share and subscribe our content. Uh, I am Sharan Sethi, your host, uh, and this is me signing off. Thank you. Please remember to subscribe to us and switch on the notifications for this channel. For our other social media links, more content and to support our work, please visit CITTI.net. Dhanavad. Namaskar.